Uh, welcome to our, uh, our Red Fest, uh, sponsored by uh, Mill City Farmers Market and Sunrise Flower Mill. Uh, my name is Darrell Glanville. I'm a Sunrise Flower Mill. My wife and I uh, own uh, the flower mill we started about 10 years ago, milling organic flour, and as we got into Harrogate's flour. And <clears throat> so that's what brought us here. Okay? I can tell you one of the benefits of uh, of bread making, a side benefit, is the wonderful people you run into at events like this and, and, and in bread baking in general. People are friendly and, and, and great. Um, a couple of people at the market here that I want to point out to you that, that, uh, that do good good things for, for, for the community. Uh, Melanie with her, her Art Andy's project, you see her work around here all over. Uh, the other group is CTI, which is just here this week and uh, it's Compatible Technologies International. And I'm having this young lady tell you just a little bit about that before we get into our bread baking. Hi, my name is Lizzie, and I'm with CTI. We are the first booth on the left when you walk in from Chicago. And we are a St. Paul-based nonprofit that designs and distributes agricultural tools for small farmers. Um, we primarily focus on the post-harvest period, so helping farmers remove grain from the stock, grind grain into flour, um, and if you'd like to see those tools in action, you can come visit our booth. Thank you. It's a great organization. I would encourage you to find out about it. Okay, so how many people are bread bakers? Almost everyone has done some bread baking. So how, many, how many are real successful bread bakers? <laughs> Not so many. Well, hopefully we can kick it up a notch if you'll let me use that words today. Uh, I can tell you that if you use good high quality flour, you'll, you'll be, begin to be a better baker right away. Okay? The uh, flour is a complicated uh, business and uh, heritage grain <coughs> came about in our setting by my experience with gluten intolerance. And I turned out to be owning a, a flour mill and, 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 and discovered that I was gluten intolerant. Okay? Uh, I had some symptoms that I, I had a great lot of difficulty getting rid of. Acid reflux to a point where I was sleeping sitting up. <clears throat> went to Rochester twice and the best they could do was say, to, you know, take antacids. Then I went to Buca one night and picked out on pasta and bread sick as heck the next day and it finally dawned on me, maybe it's the gluten folks. So I went gluten free for a, a couple a couple of days, felt much better. Okay? So I discovered I had gluten intolerance. <clears throat> that, made, that led me to try to make decent bread with gluten free and that didn't work out very well. So I kept looking, kept investigating and came upon the thought that if we go back to ancient grains, perhaps we can digest that more easily and it will be uh, tolerable for us. So that's how we got into heritage grains. Started with spelt and einkorn and emmer, some of these you've heard of. Um, they're ancient grains, but they don't bake very well in my estimation. And so we had to find grains that bake well. And we uh, settled on turkey red, which is a, probably was the predominant grain in the Midwest before we started hybriding in the 50s. So we have we, we, we get turkey red and we source that for Mennonites in western Kansas. And we, we, we have red fife, which is also a red hard wheat, that we source from uh, uh, Mennonites in, in Alberta, Canada. So we have two heritage wheats. And uh, these wheats are very much alive, they bake very well, and we encourage people to try them, either ours or other heritage wheats, if you have gluten issues. The bonus is that they bake better than any flowers ever baked with, too, whether you have uh, gluten issues or not. So that's the that's the bonus of heritage flowers and, and, uh, and heritage grains. So what we're going to do today is we have three experts, but they went someplace far back here, uh, and myself. They're all, these are all seasoned bakers, and they have uh, small presentations to make on different phases of that bread baking process that will help elevate your baking skills, okay? Um, Jonathan, uh, well, the first one is gonna be Chris, and Chris, yeah, yeah, the first one is me, and I'll go through some of the things we've got over here. 
And then, uh, then Chris Bowles, who has uh, Iron Flower, a bread drop, and he'll tell you about that. Uh, Chef Jonathan Kay, who has Heritage Breads over at our booth and sells them weekly here, with, uh, made with uh, Sunrise Flour and Flour. And uh, John, who has been the winner of the bread contest here the last few years, and was disqualified and made a judge because he won the contest so often, I think is how that works. So, so we'll, they'll, they'll, they'll be doing the pre you know, presentation as well. I have a little display over here that we can look at after you, after you and my, my cord's not going to go this far, so I'll try it without it. Uh, if you guys can hear if I can speak up, okay? I just got a lot of the tools and gizmos you need to, 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 to bake with. All of them aren't necessary. But if you get into it, they're they're desirable. Okay. Um, cast iron, Dutch oven will make those kinds of crusts for you. Okay. Uh, the the uh, trying to trying to add steam to your oven is very difficult. So the cast iron oven baking and that takes the place of trying to steam your oven. You can't, how many quarts is size is that? It's an eight quart, I believe. Eight quart. Yeah. And I think others others will work. I think John's got a green one there that's got porcelain on it. Oh, it works yeah. just fine. That's what I was you know, yeah. yeah. So, so these are some of the of the, of the things that you know the next step after you pardon, the next step after you after you uh, get some good flour in your in your in your pantry is how you're gonna bake with it. And if you look at the old recipes, and the, the, you know, Joy of Cooking even, or some of the old recipes for bread, there's a lot of things in the bread. You know, they, have, they, have, they add sugar, they add oil, sometimes citric acid, add, added more gluten. And I, I, I really believe those recipes reflect the flour of the time. The, the flour, the, you know, conventional flour needs a lot of teasing to get, to get baked into a decent loaf of bread. Let's just be kind and say that. It's just not very good, okay? If you go to, Good heritage flour, flour, water, salt, yeast. That's all you need. Okay. So those those, those four components are the basis for all of our uh, of our recipes. Whether we add rye a bit later, and or or whether we do a whole whole wheat uh, bread bread, or just a a, a a full white loaf. But it all starts with those four components. The yeast can be come in two two forms. A natural starter or sourdough, as we call it, or commercial yeast. Okay, and I have some sourdough starter here. If you're interested in it and you want to take some home with you and try and maintain the starter, to use that as a as your as your bread starter, I would encourage you to take it. Uh, you know, take a bit of it home with you. Okay. Um, the Some of the, you know, I, I can go through some of those other things later, later I guess, but uh, um, I don't know. Uh, commercial yeast, the, the commercial yeast that, 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 that I use is dry active yeast, and I find that works as well as, 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 any, as any. Keep it in the refrigerator, okay? Um, I think I'm going to let, let, let Chris go. And when we finish, and I'll encourage you to come in, into the back and sample some of the breads of the folks back there. We've got six or eight people back here, and we've got uh, there's a sourdough back there and a harvest sheath, which is a very interesting decorative kind of bread. Which would be interested in some baguettes and a hollow bread. So uh, all of these are contributions that we ask people to bring in and share with us. So. Uh, Go back and get a sample of bread when we're finished and, and chat with these folks, okay? Uh, I'll let Chris now talk about his... Uh... Uh, good morning. How's everybody doing? All right. Well, thanks for coming out this morning. My name is Chris, as Marty had said. Uh, if you, you can find me. I'm on Instagram. It's Fire and Flower, and then eventually there'll be a website and Twitter and Facebook, all the modern technology I'm slowly learning. I'm going to speak on the mixing process. One thing with fire and flour that I do is all my bread is handmade, so I use no machine. I have in the past. 
I've worked at bakeries and I'm baking at home and I've used machines, but I have found that for me, I enjoy the tactile feel of the bread using my hands. Plus I know I can mix something and if somebody blindfolded me, I can just judge how that dough is coming together by just using these. It's nothing that somebody can teach you right away. It's something that takes time, trial and error, trial and error. I've done many, many breads that have turned out quite poorly, but it's a great learning experience. So one thing I always tell people, with mixing, decide if you want to use a machine or by hand. Is one better than the other? No, I would say not. You can produce great bread with a machine or by your hands. But one thing that is going to help make great bread is, of course, great flour. Sunrise, of course. Anywhere you go in the country, there are going to be people who are selling, the small farms who are selling great quality heritage grain flour. That, in my opinion, is what makes a great bread. So hand, machine, like I said. Each one, it's up to you, it's your preference. I prefer by hand. It's something that I have developed over time, and it's something that I think lets you enjoy the mixing process that much more because you have 100% interest and involvement in it by using your hands. So with mixing, there's kind of three main ideas with mixing. One is, of course, just the distribution of the ingredients. If you have three different types of flour in your bowl, your mixing bowl, you need to all kind of incorporate those together so you don't have different types of flour or other ingredients, whether there's seeds in there, fruit, other embellishments. You want to distribute it all throughout. The next is to hydrate the flour and hydrate the ingredients. Water is your most basic, but you can use other ingredients to hydrate your flour. You can use milk, you can use juice, you can use beer, you can kind of be very, very creative. So you're going to hydrate that flour, then hydrate the ingredients. And then, as soon as you add that water, that liquid, that is going to start forming your gluten. So distribute the ingredients, hydrate the flour and the ingredients, and start that gluten formation. There is one thing, as soon as you start adding that liquid to your flour, is when you can start judging your dough consistency. Is it going to be a higher hydration dough? lower hydration dough. Another benefit I feel of using your hands is you can judge that right off the bat. Using Sunrise Flour, I've been using that for probably a couple of years now. It's not always the exact same every single bag I get. It varies a little bit. I like that. It's not an exact science, but using my hands, I can tell this flour is going to react a little bit differently than, say, the previous bag of flour I had. So getting that dough consistency right off the bat, using the hands is a way to start building that foundation of making great bread. So after you mix, you've added your water, whatever your hydration is. There's a term that's out there. Some of you might be familiar with it. Some of you may not. It's called auto lease. Sometimes people say auto lies. Pretty well it just means take a rest, take a break, let the flour, what's happening is you introduce that liquid to the flour, mix the dough, so here's kind of a very shaggy, so I mixed this, probably started about an hour ago. I let it have an auto ease, which is just a break, so I added the flour and the water, the water to the flour, excuse me, mixed it together. I didn't add any salt at the time. I just let it sit. What that is doing, that break, that auto ease, is allowing the flour and the proteins within the flour to hydrate. Auto ease can be a beneficial tool in the whole process, but it is not going to guarantee you, as I've seen some places, it's like, oh, if you do an auto ease, you're going to have great bread. No, it's just a stage. It's a tool that can be used to produce good to excellent bread because you're allowing the flour and the gluten to hydrate, allowing those the starch to absorb the liquid. Autolyse will decrease your overall mixing time, whether you're doing it by hand or machine, but then it's going to increase dough extensibility. So you're going to increase how that dough can stretch. Two terms you'll hear in baking is extensibility and elasticity. Elasticity, it's a rubber band. How will it spring back? Extensibility, 
how far will it extend? So the unlease can be a beneficial process, but it is not going to make or break. If all the other steps are not executed perfectly, just doing an auto lease is not going to guarantee you have a perfect bread, but it is a good, valuable tool. Mixing by hand, and I will keep throughout the morning and as other guys are talking, I'll keep mixing this and I encourage you guys all to come up and I can move it over and you'll see how the dough goes from, as it was shaggy, it's a little bit smoother now, the sun is definitely adding another factor in here, but it'll come together and get more and more and it'll get smooth, very, very supple. So if you're using machine, traditionally you'll see kind of three different types of mixes. You're going to have a short mix, an improved mix, and an intensive mix. I'm not going to go too far in depth right now. If you want more on those types of mixes, please stop by, talk to me, we can go further in depth. The different types of mix pretty well correlates with the type of end dough you are working with, whether you have a lean dough, a rustic dough, an enriched dough, or an embellished dough. So yeah, just kind of think short, improved, or intensive mix. Those are your three if you're using machine. Another term you'll see out with mixing is something called a stretch and fold or a punch and fold. When I was a kid, it was always, oh, you just degas it. So, you, you know, my parents would let me kind of punch the dough per se. Stretching and folding, the benefit of that is a way to stretch out the gluten strands, overlap them. You're also redistributing the food, the sugars that are within that flour, so the wild yeast, the natural bacteria, or if you are also using commercial yeast, kind of have some new food to smorgasbord on, to eat. So stretching and folding is a way to increase the gluten, the strength, to realign it, but also to, to redistribute the yeast throughout the dough. And then last is fermentation. That kind of ties in with Jonathan, who's speaking next. But if you want to a way you can kind of change the end product with your mixing is your fermentation. So it's just time and temperature. When you are going to mix, there's a term also that you'll see thrown around in there is called the final dough temperature. Most yeast, wild and commercial, is going to be happiest from a 73 to 78 degree Fahrenheit kind of window temperature. So with that, with the fermentation, the slower you ferment, you ferment your bread, you're going to elicit different flavor profiles out of that wheat versus if you do a higher temperature and a higher, or excuse me, a shorter fermentation time. So you can use a lot of different tools that are really nothing you have to pay for. It's just time and temperature and getting creative with that to change the end flavor profile and kind of the structure of your bread. Uh, I hope this kind of brief overview of mixing, gave you some enlightenment or idea of how it's done. If you want more in depth of just the mixing process or how I do things, please stop by. Like I said, I'll keep mixing this and you'll be able to see how it visually changes, but also to come up and touch it. I, you know, I'll bake this this afternoon. I don't care if 10 or a thousand people touch it. I'll still bake it at home and see how it turns out. But thank you very much for your time for being out here. Like I said, if you have any questions, Please uh, pull me aside and we can talk further. Have a look here. Some, some, there's a... Alright. When I mix at home, I usually use this large mixing bowl that I have here. I just do it in here. It keeps it clean. But when there's a entertaining and fun way to mix dough. Some people refer to it as the old French way. And I'll do that here. It's a little noisy, but it's just another way of mixing by hand that you can do. This is what we've been waiting for. Slap and fold. Yeah. the dough changing in consistency. Yeah. 
So even with that short amount of time, it definitely smooths it out a little bit. It's still, the gluten is still really weak, so it's tearing a little bit, but you can see even just with that little bit of slap and fold, or kind of the old French way of doing it, it's a way to start aligning that gluten, building that gluten, building that structure in the dough. It's a fun way to mix, but when I have three kids and doing this at three o'clock in the morning, I can't do it that way. So that's why I use a mixing bowl, so I keep the, the wife and the kids happy with the quiet house. But it's a fun, entertaining way. You do it a lot, it's kind of a good workout. You can really get going, especially if you have a large total amount of dough to do. Nice job. Thank you. Jonathan? Hi there. My name is Jonathan. I am the owner of Heritage Breads. I taught at Lakota Blue for 14 years and left there in February and started this company. We're over in the Sunrise Flour Mill booth uh, with bread. And I'm going to talk about uh, the next stage from this, which is the resting fermentation part, which is very, very important. So right now that, that dough is very tight. We need to let that relax um, and ferment. And this is the first fermentation. So what I would do is put that in the proofer. Uh, at home, you could put it right in the oven with your uh, light on. That is a good temperature in there to be able to proof it. Every half an hour, I will take that dough and kind of take my hand from the bottom side, fold it over, and just work my way right around the bowl. And until I'm done, flip it over, put that back in there. And I do that for four hours every half an hour. So it's really not a matter of how much work you're doing. It's, a, as Chris said, time and temperature. So having the right temperature in there for the bread to, for the dough to ferment and the proof. And just letting the time do the work. Because that bacteria in the culture is expanding and growing. After the four hours, I will then pull that out, put it on my table, and portion it out. And depending on what size loaf you want, um, remember when you do bake, you are losing a portion of that through evaporation of the liquid. Uh, so like a one and a half pound wet dough will end up being about a pound and a quarter, a little more. Once it bakes, just through that natural water evaporating once it bakes. So think about that depending on what size loaf you want. Um, so after it comes out, I will portion the dough out to whatever size. You then want to let it rest. So I just put that on my tabletop counter, a little bit of flour on top, and just cover it with some plastic or a towel. And because if I try to start shaping the dough at that point, it's going to be too tight. Because you you've already moved it, you cut it. Also, when you're portioning it out, very important, you want to try to get as close to the size in one cut as possible. Because if you start having to cut little pieces of that dough to make up your, your amount, it, 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 it's not going to rise as well. Okay? Um, so once it's rested for about half an hour, you then want to start shaping the dough. And what we're trying to do with shaping is really build the structure into the dough so that way when you do put it in the oven, it's going to have enough structure to rise rather than just falling down once that heat hits it. Um, there's a number of ways to shape the dough. Uh, so similar to what Chris was doing, but a lot more gentle, where you're folding the edges over, almost like making an envelope. Um, there's also taking the dough and rolling it in your hands, like you're making a little, uh, little uh, hamburger bun. From that point, there's a couple of ways we can, and I know John will talk about this more, um, ways you can keep the dough. You're either going to ferment it at that point or proof it for another three to four hours to get the structure. What I do and what Chris does is we put it in the fridge overnight. And that's going to add another whole dimension of flavor again. By, again, that time part, that bacteria, uh, this is called to retard the fermentation. So it's fermenting or proofing, but very, very slowly in the fridge. But that's going to give you a lot more flavor than just proofing and baking the same day. A um, couple of ways you can do that. Banneton. So you would line this with... Yeah. Um, this has 
whenever I'm doing using this, I use rice flour instead of regular flour. It's a little drier. You don't once your dough is fermented and ready, you don't want to add any more flour to it, that raw flour, because it's nothing. It's going to change the way the bread bakes, the way the bread tastes. Um, so the rice flour is a little dry. It's going to help you with the shaping. So you're either going to put it right in here, and that will then sit overnight or for the four hours. Or I've actually found these really great kind of lint-free white cloths. I'll dust that with some rice flour, put that into a bowl, and then put the dough right in here. You want to cover that and then let that sit in the fridge overnight. Once that's done, you will then pull that out of the fridge, or you could even use a bread basket. I've used that before, which actually gives you like a loaf size instead, instead of a round uh, shape. Once it comes out of the fridge, you then want to let that warm up, and that's going to take between three and four hours. Again, you want to let that bacteria start to get active from the culture in the bread. You want to let it rise. And what I found is, a good judge is one, it shouldn't be cold. The other thing is if you touch it and it springs back nice and quickly, then you kind of know it's ready. If it starts getting bubbles on the top, then you're going to be careful it may be overproof. You know, once bubbles start to, there's more bacteria than you need. Um, and then John's going to talk about temperature and how to bake. Yeah, question? What are you covering it with when it's in the refrigerator? In the refrigerator, I just uh, cover it with a paper bag, or the plastic bag, that's all. Yeah. You, just want, you just don't want it to dry out. Or I'll take another one of these towels or a little flour, put it on top. But you do want to cover it with a plastic bag so that way it doesn't dry out in the fridge because you don't want it forming a skin. Now remember, when you're putting it into any of these, that whatever's going on the bottom, that's what's getting, that's your presentation side. That's what's going to be turned out, and then you're going to bake that. Uh, if anyone has any more questions on these items, uh, just let me know after. Okay, thank you. I'll have John, the past winner of the uh, bread contest here in the last few years before last year. And a member of what, St. Paul, I know, before last year, Jonathan won out last year, but the years before were won by John Jacobson. And he's a member of the St. Paul Bread Club, and uh, we'll hear from him now. And after we, after John finishes, then we, if you have questions, we can ask all three of these guys and come up with the best answers, hopefully. Thanks. Uh, how's everybody doing today? All right. Everybody get a couple of samples of bread earlier. There will be samples afterwards too. So um, my fellow panelists make some awesome bread. Thanks guys for bringing it in. So also thank you for doing a good job of bringing everybody up to this part of the process. I'm going to talk about a couple of things in the baking process. So you've mixed it well. You've done your time and temperature right. You've got everything shaped and you're kind of getting ready for your oven. So you're preheating your oven before you I think the best thing to do is to preheat your oven while you're doing your final proof. You want, don't wait until 10 minutes beforehand, you want a hot oven. One of the things that we as home bakers struggle with, we benchmark ourselves against the professional bakers. And it's really tough with a home kitchen to achieve those results. But through um, shared knowledge in the baking community, we're going to show you a couple of things that you can do. And one of the biggest Two of the uh, most popular questions I get are, how do you get those fancy shapes on your bowls, on your loaves, and how do you get it to taste like it came out of a, uh, a wood-burning oven or out of a professional baker's oven? So time and temperature gets you there, and then what you're going to do is, after you, get your, after you get your product into the oven, there's more chemistry that's happening. And what's going on in that oven is your yeast is being killed by the heat of the oven. And before the yeast is actually killed off, it's going like in hyper mode, and that's what gives you your loaf its spring. The yeast is trying to survive. That heat just drives it crazy until the point it expires. And then when that's happening, all of your dough is, is starting to set itself. There's starches in the flour, in the dough, and that's your cell structure. So the yeast is doing everything it can to do what 
to maximize the benefit of all the mixing and shaping and folding that was done beforehand. So if you do all that right and then you get it into the oven properly, you're going to have great bread. I guarantee it. So I'm going to uh, ask one of my uh, co-workers here, co-sponsors, uh, to hold the microphone. And I'm going to go through what I do uh, to get, I'm going to do what I, what I do to get a loaf of bread into one of these Dutch ovens that's 450 degrees. So, excuse me, I can... So, an hour beforehand, when you started your final proof, you took your oven, you took your oven and you heated it up to 450 or 500 degrees, whatever the recipe is, and you're gonna put your Dutch oven in there, empty, okay? Now it's time to uh, proof. Now it's time to get that proof dough into here somehow, safely. Safety's number one, right? Because you wanna be around to enjoy what you just spent hours doing. So, important tools are these gloves. So I have a good set of gloves handy and leave this in the oven until the last minute. So I'm gonna take a couple of, I'm gonna take this and we're gonna imagine that this is the, this is full of dough. And what I'm gonna do is what I, there's two ways you can do this. You can proof right in the basket and get those nice rings. There you go, right there. So you can proof right and get those nice rings. So everybody wants to know, how do you get those fancy rings? With the rice flour. So with the rice flour in there. So you can get these from Lucky Penny Trading for maybe seven to 10 bucks online. Um, the other way that I like to do it is to take a piece of linen that I've got at the remnant area at a fabric store. Dough does not like to stick to linen. So um, the dough is in there. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna roll out a, a sheet of parchment paper and I'm gonna put it over the top of this and I'm gonna go just like this, okay? And now I've got my ball of dough that's ready to go. Except I gotta get it into this 450 or 500 degree thing and I gotta do that rather quickly. So one of the one of the tools that you're gonna use in this part of your process is a serrated knife or a razor blade, but I find a serrated knife. I've done hundreds of pounds of loaves of bread with this simple serrated knife that I bought at Tuesday morning. Um, and all you're gonna do is you're going to put a, put a cut in the top of your dough and that's gonna tell the yeast where to expand. Okay, so if you wanna put a tic-tac-toe pattern on there, it'll expand. If you wanna do a ring around it, it's gonna expand. So if you just do one line down the center, and you can agonize over it, but what you're doing is you're trying to control what's happening with that yeast that's going spastic in the oven. So, could you grab me that underproof one? Well, Daryl brought in a couple of great samples. No, the other one. So, this bread, this bread was sliced, but one thing that happened was it wasn't ready to be sliced. So it's important to know that your bread is ready to be sliced. If it's tight on the inside, you're gonna get this blowout. And this is underproof. So this slicing will control where it goes, but you still have to pay attention to time and temperature and make sure the texture of your bread is ready to go. All right. So right before I slash this dough, I go around I take a scissors and I cut around it and this is all I have now. And what I, and what I do is I set this, I leave myself a little tab at the end so that I can grab it with the gloves. Okay, so I put that tab on the edge of the table and I walk over to the oven and I say good morning, hot oven take this out, put the cover on something safe and out of the way, and all I do now is I take my gloved hands like this, walk over to the pot, place it in there, cover this, into the oven it goes for 20 minutes, 20 minutes covered. And what's going on is you're getting a brick oven effect. The professional bakers have steam injected ovens. 
and that's a big advantage in this. The steam injected into the oven, what it does is it keeps the top of the dough nice and soft and moist. You can imagine if it was in a dry oven, it would, it would harden. So this allows it to spring a lot more and get big volume and give you big open structure in your crumb. 20 minutes goes by, you can take this off and you'll see it's actually starting to brown. Even with it covered, it does not have to be uncovered to start browning. And then I let it bake for another 15 to 25 minutes. And sometimes if I'm really in the mood for a, a really you know, big flavored bread, I'll leave it in there for another 30 minutes where it's almost black. Ken Forkish, one of the books that uh, Daryl brought, talks about that technique and it's really kind of fun when you do it. The first time I did it, I, I scared my son that, what did I just do? But I tell you what, it was one of the best breads that I ever made. So, all right, so now you, you gotta get this thing out of the oven. We worked like crazy to get it in there. It took a lot of time. So you just take this thing out of the oven, and what I do is I just, on top of the oven, take it out, put it down, and put this somewhere safe. Put the lid back on it, and put it safe somewhere, get it out of the way. And a lot of times I'll just leave my leather gloves on it so my wife knows it's hot. And then this has to, this, I can't emphasize this part of the process enough, this has to cool. Do not take your bread and go, oh, give me the butter, tear into it, no because it'll compress. Your starches haven't fully set, and there's actually some breads that take a couple of days uh, to set up, like rye breads, breads that are big in rye. They need 24 to 48 hours for those starches to set. So give this, I would say, three hours to cool down before you before you dig into it. And then when you, uh, to, to keep this thing fresh, the first day you can put it in a linen bag, and that's a great way to keep the crust uh, crunchy and the, uh, the crumb soft on the inside, and after that, if it's around for more than today, then I transfer it to a plastic bag. So, any que any questions on any part of that? What size of Dutch oven is that? This Dutch oven, I believe, is a five or six quart, six quart, and it does about a pound and three quarter loaf. I've got. Uh, shop around for these things, this is fun. I've, I've made a loaf of bread up to three pounds in a Dutch oven. My goal, I, I found another Dutch oven. I'm gonna try to do four pounds at one time. Just to say, just so I can say I did it. Without a brick oven. So is that the general size to get? Yeah, well, it depends on how much bread are you gonna eat. So, kind of, this is a good size. I use this for my white chicken chili all the time. Um, I use. These are workhorses in my kitchen. I use these for everything. So for uh, Guinness stew, white chicken chili, um, French pot chicken. So buy yourself a couple of them and bake bread. Bake all kinds of stuff. So start with the size you think you're going to use for your loaf and go with that. Good question. Thanks. How can you tell when a loaf is cool enough? How can you tell when a loaf is cool enough? Great question. Um, well, you can when it's room temperature, I guess. And you just have to feel it. The, the targeted uh, final temperature is gonna be, for a loaf like this, for a lean bread, is gonna be somewhere between 200 and 210 degrees on the inside. So, and you can do that with your thermometer if you've got one of the instant read thermometers, which you should have anyway for the first part of the process. So, excellent question, thank you. Other questions? Martha, any questions this morning? Okay. All right, thank you everybody. So I guess we'll go to uh, sampling our breads and uh, coming to the different tables if you've got questions. Um, a lot of the uh, utensils that I was talking about are over here. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we appreciate your attendance and I uh, hope you enjoyed it. I forgot oh, over here. Uh, I've got a list of terminology and uh,